All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 12. We'll be baptizing tonight. Chloe is going to be baptized. I'll keep that in mind. Show her that it matters to you that she's being baptized and come tonight and you can be witness. And uh, she's only been saved a few days now. So Chloe will be baptized in service this evening. Uh, the book of Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 43. The scripture says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also. Now note carefully, this is important. Unto this generation. Bless this book now in thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This past week I have, uh, past couple of weeks I suppose, I have watched uh, a, a, a video and uh, I have the book uh, by Jonathan Kahn, Return of the Gods. And I don't know if you've seen that yet. Uh, I highly recommend it. And this is quite an eye-opening book. Not so much some of the facts that he covers, which are right, but it's the way he puts it together, the format. And that is what pre that's what I'm going to try, by the grace of God, to present to you this morning. I'm not a plagiarist, and I'm not going to get up here and take credit for something that's not mine. I want you to understand a lot of what I'm going to be saying is from that book. And then there's some material that I'll be covering that I've, ta that I've done myself. But he, in his book on the return of the gods, I want you to listen to me carefully this morning now. You'll never hear anything on CBS, NBC, and ABC, even CNN or Fox, that has anything to do comes anywhere near what I'm going to be talking about this morning. So I'd like for you to listen carefully. In his book and video of the return of the gods, he talks about the dark trinity that's coming back to America. When I say back to America, it's because at one time America was, at least on the surface, a Christian nation. America had a lot of believers in it. Still does, but it wasn't that many years ago that upwards of 80 to 90 percent of all Americans said they were Christians. Today it's hardly 60 percent, and the figure is dropping in free fall. So people are abandoning the church in droves. Why, are, why is that? Why are they leaving? Because there's a spiritual part of a man that can only be satisfied not by physical things, but by Almighty God. So somewhere along the line, it seems to me like like uh, most of what calls itself the church is an absolute, complete, abject failure. How many of you agree with me that this morning? Amen. And so I'm going to get into what he talks about. First of all, the first one of the dark trinity that is coming back. Now, the idea here from the book of Matthew 12 is that once these spirits leave... And then, my friend, return, when they return, the state of that man is worse than it ever was before. And he is saying that the spirits now are returning to America and lays out the foundation of why they're coming back. And this is important to understand the principle and thesis of this book. So the first one of the dark trinity to come to America since the Holy Spirit has been turned away, since they've turned God. God out of school, since they've kicked prayer out of school, and my dear friend, taken the word away from most of the people in this country, the first spirit that comes back is the spirit of Baal or Baal. That is the spirit of the possessor. Now he noticed, notice carefully his progression in his thought and a progression in the way this thing works. It is the Possessor, And the possessor simply is the one who comes, first of all, to take away all that is good. In other words, to create a vacuum. And my dear friend, once a vacuum is created, then something will rush to take its place. And that's what Baal does. And so in the 60s, when they began to kick God out of the, out of the schools, out of the, out of the marketplace, out of, out of the public square, when they did all of that, then they opened the door by doing that for a spirit that would replace the almighty will not stay where he's not wanted 
Note carefully what it says in the book of Romans chapter number one. As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Yeah. And so therefore the possessor comes and he begins to take possession because the door has been open and God was driven from the schools, the culture, the public square, the universities, the corporate America, and on and on and on and on and on and on the list goes. Let me tell you something this morning, how close you are to completely losing your freedom of speech, which is the First Amendment. How close, preacher, when they throw the preachers in jail. When they come for the pastors and the evangelists, mark it down, that's in. All freedom of speech is gone when that happens from this country. Right now, the marketplace, the school systems, everything else out there, you know as well as I do, you have no freedom of speech. There are places out there that if you voice your opinion, you're finished. At that moment, there is no debate in the colleges. It is, it is their way or no way. If you don't believe that I'm correct in this, just go check it out. So like a cancer, it has eaten into that freedom of speech. And my dear friend, if you don't have freedom of speech, then nothing the rest of it matters. And so out goes God. And when he goes out, what comes in his place? Baal. And so Baal has entered in to destroy everything and turn it upside down that America had ever believed and loved. And so then what happens? Well, the second evil spirit or the second spirit to return would be the enchantress. And this is what uh, Mr. Khan puts in his book. So who is this? This is the wife of Baal. Her name is Ashtoreth. And she goes by different names according to the culture. The culture accommodates according to their culture, renames this goddess, but she's the same thing wherever she goes. Her name is Ashtoreth. She's called Ishtar. She's called Aphrodite. She's called Venus. She's called Diana. She's called this and she's called that. But here is what marks her character. She is a wildly fanatic, sexual, deviant, and pervert. She knows no bounds. She, cross, she knows no barriers. She is free to run wild in every direction she possibly can. She brings sexual immorality, sexual perversion. Everything that has to do with sex is her market. And so this is Ashtoreth. How could this happen, preacher? How in the world could something like that come to a Christian country like America? It's not Christian anymore, folks. You kicked God out and let Baal come in. Now, I'm going to get to the churches in just a few minutes to show you how far God's been kicked out. But he's out. And so since he's out, the goddess of sexuality, sexual immorality, self-gratification, she can't control herself. She's called a harlot. She's called a prostitute. Did you know that the Greek word for prostitute is porn or porne? This is where we get the English word pornography. This is that stuff that pops up on your internet. This is what you see out there on the internet. There are millions of pornographic sites in this country. Did you know that and around the world? Let me give you just a little bit of uh, statistics as it relates to pornography. This is important because it is mind boggling when you think about the spirit of Ishtar. Pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. It's mind developing and it has that put in front of its face. God had a reason for telling you to put clothes on. 56% of American divorces involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. Now buckle up for what I'm about to tell you. 68% of church going men and 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. Of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 years old, 76% are actively searching for pornography. Now, how many of you got slapped just then? How many of you got shocked just then? How many of you had the curtain, the cover pulled back on what you're doing? How many of you are going to leave out of here today 
And this coming week, you're going to go back to your favorite pornographic site. And you're going to wonder why that you have no spiritual walk with God. You're going to wonder why that your prayers aren't answered. You want to know why your joy is gone from you. You want to know why you're bored to death in church. You want to know why that your wife is no longer that sweetheart that you married. Some of you in the first place married a pretty face. Some of you married a pretty body. And then some of you might have married somebody's soul and spirit and had a real marriage when that took place. Because the face will change, the body will change, but if the marriage is laid out according to the scripture, it'll last your whole lifetime. Amen. Fact of the matter is your love for each other will go stronger and stronger and stronger by the day. So mark it down. As surely as you live by the flesh, you'll die for the rest of your life by the flesh, for you'll never be satisfied. Satisfied. So pornography robs you of your home. It robs you of your marriage. A prostitute, uh, a prostitute brings her, her sexuality into the marketplace to be bought and sold. So what does that do to the marriage covenant of two people? It belittles it. It destroys it. It drives it down. It takes, it takes its value away. This is why today there's so many marriages are ending in divorce. They weren't married to begin with. They don't know what a marriage is. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? I've been so many. You wouldn't know. You have no idea how many marriages I performed in 46 years. And I don't know, God, the only one that knows how many of them are still married after all these years. Amen. That little girl sitting on that back row right there on December the 9th, 1966, said, I do. Now go ahead and do the math and you'll figure out how long. We've been married. We've been married more than we've been married longer than half of you have been in this world, in this building right now. That's right. And it only gets better by the day. Sweeter as the day passes. Amen. God bless your soul. I'm telling you right now, it only gets better. Love gets stronger, gets deeper, gets more personal. Do you know that? Do you have that kind of marriage? If you're watching pornography, quit it right now. Get on your face and repent. Tell God to cleanse that spirit from you. For you have picked up the spirit of Ishtar. Amen. And Ishtar connects you directly with the pornography, perversion, and all the rest of it out there. Amen. Amen. Mad at you, preacher. That's all right. You'd be mad at me. That's okay. That's all right. 57 percent of pastors say porn addiction is the most damaging issue in their congregation. Of course, I have to say for the poor old pastor, God bless your soul, son. If you're going to half the pastors are watching pornography, how in the world do you manage to get up in the pulpit on Sunday? How do you handle that? You must, they must you got, you're plugged into something I'm not plugged into. How do you do it? You need to get right with God and quit blaming everything else for the problem in the church. Turning away from God in the 60s. How many of you ever heard of psychedelic music or LSD or Woodstock? How many of you know anything about Woodstock? You see, I remember all this stuff. I showed up in 1946, folks. I grew up during all this stuff. First hand, I witnessed it. And this was when America started fast downhill away from God. The 60s was the part that opened the door. Ishtar overturns, she replaces, she perverts, she brings in pagan sexuality. Did you know that in ancient Rome, in ancient Rome, if you walk down any street in ancient Rome, you would have male or female genitalia displayed everywhere all over the place. So I didn't know that. Check it out. They were obsessed with sex. Obsessed with it. Any culture that becomes obsessed with sex is headed down. It won't make it, friend. Sex will not keep your marriage together. You've got to have something stronger than that. Something that has meaning to it. And the only meaning they'll ever join two together is when their hearts are bound together. You ought to go in this graveyard over here. It's an amazing thing. Look at all the hearts over here in this graveyard where they're joined together forever, they say, on their tombstone. Love forever. We love each other forever. We're gone together. We're long. We love each other from henceforth, and it'll never change. That's what a marriage ought to be about. Love is what a woman's looking for. Can man, can you love her? Can you love your wife? The Bible said husbands love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You initiate that love towards your wife. She's looking for that. She's looking for a man too. <laughs> 
Have you ever noticed the femininity of men today? It blows my mind, folks, of what's going on. I'm going to have to do a little digging into it, but i got some ideas of what's causing this. It's not so much the culture causing it. They're born that way, a lot of them, with a spirit that animates them and causes them to be that for the rest of their life. Where does that spirit come from? Where does it come from? What causes that in the beginning? This is a problem we've got. People need to get right with God. Amen, amen, amen. America has become sexualized. Yes, it has. Did you know that there are more witches in America than there are Presbyterians? New Age movement has taken over this country. A lot of the churches today, when they worship, it's New Age. It's New Age. New Age. That's sad, isn't it? Ancient inscriptions about Ishtar, and some of them say this, I'm a woman, I'm a man. That's androgyny. Praise is for Ishtar. You are the one that turns a man into a woman and a woman into a man. The masculine man today is called toxic masculinity. But the masculine woman is bravo. See what they're doing? Upside down, upside down. Calling evil good and good evil. The gods go after your children. Girls are being trained today to be self-sufficient. I don't need a man. And, the, and feminism, once it locked itself in to the young ladies, has literally destroyed a feminine. Men love feminine. They love the feminine woman. I don't love another man. It's a woman. It's that that draws the man. How many of you men agree with me this morning? How many of you men don't know if you're a man or a woman? Raise your hand. Amen. <laughs> Lord of God. <laughs> getting tough and it's getting bad. Amen. It, that, <laughs> there's a drawing power there. And that's one of the reasons I believe in the creator. Yes, sir. Is that makeup. That, 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 that makeup that you just can't. You can't. You can't there's no way you can, you can explain that away. And girls being self-sufficient, the boys, you know, the natural inclination of the man is to protect and defend. He's the protector, right? Amen. I mean, if somebody kicks your door down, do you send your wife down to check out and see who did? Or do you go down and see what did it? Amen. <laughs> you stay here and I'll go call for help. <laughs> yeah. Which one is it? Well, that's what we're living in, though. You see, the natural inclination of the boy or the man is to protect the girl. Look at these old movies made back in the 50s. They open the doors for the woman. If she start, they hold her by the arm. They, they move. They, 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 there's just a different spirit entirely than what we have today. What the boys do, they put them video games. They're on there shooting video games. They're doing their protecting. They're doing their fighting. But it's been taken out of the home. And it's been perverted. Then the third one is the destroyer. Once we have Baal, who does away, empties and destroys, and, and does away with God. And then we have Ishtar, the enchantress, and you are living in that age. Then what do we have left? We have the destroyer. Who's that? That's Moloch. Moloch, he's the one that laid the babies in his arms and rolled off into his belly. The Carthaginians were big on Moloch. Yeah, you remember Hannibal? You ever read about Hannibal in history? Hannibal on his, on, on his elephants as he came against Rome and all of that. Well, he came from, the, he came from North Africa, from Carth. He was a Carthaginian. Baby sacrifice, human sacrifice all over the world. What stopped it, preacher? Why did they quit? The preaching of the cross of Christ. <coughs> the gospel of the grace of God. I was born into a country that had been built upon the foundation of the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank be unto God for it. But people today, bless your soul, look what they're born into in this country now. That's sad, don't you think? Moloch, a pagan world. It's common to offer up human beings. Well, are they sacrificing any human beings in America today? How about 63 million? How about 63 million? Oh, yeah. They're sacrificing them. They're killing them. And do you know something? They're not satisfied. This stuff always leads to something else. And I was amazed when I got a hold of this. Uh, I don't remember if this brother mentions it in his thing or not. But anyway, this is, this is a California governor signs an infanticide bill. 
as California works to become the most radical abortion state. And this is by Olivia Summers, uh, dated uh, September the 30th. On September the 27th, 2022, Governor Newsom signed what amounts to be a perinatal, in other words, after birth, infanticide bill, AB 2223, along with 12 other pro-abortion bills, as we've informed you, AB 2223 is especially egregious because it prevents coroners from investigating the deaths related to or following known or suspected self-induced or criminal abortion, including deaths of babies during the perinatal period, which is up to 28 days after birth. Now, what's that? What's that? That's infanticide. But you see, it's a small step to kill the baby and then kill in the womb and then kill uh, the baby that's been born. It's a small step. You have noticed how radical, how radical these left wing fanatics became when the Supreme Court said, here's all they said. They didn't stop abortion. What did they do? They said, send it back to the states. Let Tennessee determine, or Alabama, or Florida, or Michigan, you know, or New Hampshire, let them determine their laws on abortion. No, oh boy, I have never seen such wild fanaticism in a long time when it came to that. It's freedom of my body. Really? There's a little baby inside your body. But you see, it's, 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 it's there. There's a reason for it. There's a reason because now we're taking step by step by step, which opens the door. We have a nation full of men and women that are possessed by the spirit of Baal, by the spirit of Ashtoreth, by the spirit of Moloch. How do you act when the Holy Ghost begins to move on your soul? Do you want to kill somebody? Or do you want to pray and sing praises to God? When the Holy Spirit begins to move in you, don't you feel a compassion and a warmth toward people, especially somebody that needs help? They need prayer. Doesn't it, doesn't it move you to want to pray for them? If some soul comes into the house and you know they're beaten down, you, you can tell they're, they're just beaten to death. Do you, do you, do you snub up and, and say, look at me, I'm, I'm so much better than that? Or do you say, Lord, help me. Maybe I can be a hand. Maybe I can lay some handfuls on purpose. Maybe I can be there to help that person. Maybe I can do something. And my friend, that's the Holy Spirit. And of course, the beginning of the Holy Spirit in your life when he convicted you of your sin and showed you you were an unbeliever and showed you Christ and told you you needed to trust him and believe on the Lord Jesus and you should be saved. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's when it started. I spent 27 years. And the only spirit I knew was the spirit of hell until 1973. And the Holy Ghost moved into my soul. November of 1620 was late to plant crops. Many settlers died of scurvy and malnutrition during that horrible first winter. Of the 102 original Mayflower passengers, only 44 survived. The Pilgrims' remarkable courage, now this is important, their remarkable courage was displayed the following spring when the Mayflower returned to Europe. Not a single pilgrim deserted Plymouth. The Mayflower, Mayflower stayed there during the winter so they'd have somewhere to sleep on that ship, you know, something to help them get through that first winter at Plymouth Rock. And so the next spring, all right, the captain says, anybody that wants to go back to England, you can go back to England. Not one soul. You see, men had their wives buried out there. Women had their husbands buried out there. They had their little children buried out there. Their moms and their dads were buried out there. In other words, they put roots down there. They weren't about to leave. God put them there, they said. God's going to bless us here. And he did bless them. Yeah. William Bradford in 1623 was chosen as the first governor of these people. He declared a day of thanksgiving to thank God. And think about it now. That's only a couple of years, a few years after this initial encounter with death. And they were just reeling and, and just now beginning to recover from it. And he said, let's thank God. Let's thank God. 
And so he thanked them. He said, inasmuch as the great father's given us this year and his abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, beans, squashes, garden vegetables, has made the forest abound with game and the sea with fish and clams, inasmuch as he's protected us from the ravages of the savages, has spared us from pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. He declared a day of thanksgiving. He thanked God for food, for protection, and for freedom. That's a wonderful thing. In 1590, 1590, full 33 years before this, in 1590, one of the creepiest, most unsettling mysteries to still hover over America took place. The history of the United States might just be the story of Roanoke Island. Who's ever heard of that now? Yes, Roanoke Island. Located just off the coast of North Carolina in modern day Dare County, Roanoke Island, was home to a group of 115 settlers who went missing. Missing. After a harsh winter in 1590. End of story. So what do you mean? They've never found them. They've never found any evidence of where they went. They have, not, they have not been able to find anything. Just a few clues here and there. And the clues, they try to follow them out and they're still in a mystery. What happened to these people 33 years before Plymouth? What happened to them? We have no idea. Now, you can do your own research. I mean, stuff like that causes me to go home and start looking. <laughs> Good. <laughs> God blessed them up there in Plymouth, didn't he? He let them land where the Indians were friends, friendly, friendly Indians, Native Americans, if you, they were friendly, okay? God gave them the environment they needed to prosper and be blessed. And so what did William Bradford do? He thanked God. I'm gonna give you three scriptures and I'll come to a close. Listen to this, Romans 1, 21. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination. The foolish heart was darkened. This was the downfall of what wound up to be perversion to the worst sort in Romans 1. 2 Timothy 3, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. God mentions that more than once. And then finally in Hebrews 13, listen carefully to this. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Here's what he said. He said that circumstances may not make you feel like it. And the environment may not cause you to feel like it. You may not even feel like it. But he said, if you'll give a sacrifice of praise in the sight of God, that is giving thanks. And what's that mean? That means that you're giving something to God, a sacrifice, you see, that you did not, that you, you know, you, you, in other words, there's not a pile of gold in front of you where you're thanking God for it. You're simply saying, Lord, you're the Lord, and you watch every moment of my life, every breath that I take, everything that I do, it's in your hands. And so, Lord, I'm going to praise you because you're the Lord, and I'm going to bless your righteous holy name. Because you're a good God. You've been good to me. Amen. That's the sacrifice of praise. Amen. That's what that means. And giving thanks to God. Yes. Now I'll leave you with this, folks. One of the most important things that you can find in your spiritual life is not how high you can shout, climb a wall, jump, run. And I'm not against none of this stuff. I'm not up here to criticize. I'm going to tell you something. The greatest thing you'll determine to find in your life to mark your spirituality is whether you have a thankful heart or not. Thankful, thankful, thankful. The old boy said, I thank to God I'm not as other men. You hear him? That's what he was thankful for, his self-righteousness. I'm thankful because I've got a family I can sit down with this coming Thursday. People I love dearly in this world. I'm thankful to God because I've got that because I could be out here under a bridge somewhere. I thank God for that. 
I thank God for being able to stand up here before you this morning and bring the message that God put on my heart. I've delivered my soul. I'm free now. I can sleep. I'm thankful to God for his calling on my life to give me a reason to live. 76 years old, but i got a reason to go on. Say, when are you going to retire? When he retires me. Amen. When's he going to retire you? Come up hither, son. That's when he retires me. That's when I'm retiring. <laughs> so I'm here until God's done with me. Do you have that kind of life? Do you have a joyful life? Do you have joy in your life? Do you have, are you, do you have any satisfaction in your soul? Are you thankful? Are you really thankful? Are you really thankful? Somebody told me the other day in the back there, said this little baby, they had this little baby, and said that, uh, and, and this little baby, when it was born, its daddy wouldn't even come to the hospital. Wouldn't even come to the hospital. Lay drunk. Lay drunk. Wouldn't even come to the hospital for the birth of his child. He doesn't know anything about life. He doesn't know what's valuable. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything. How many of you in here this morning really believe that Thanksgiving ought to be something for a soul-searching time of the year? I've told you a thousand times, to me, to me, it is the most Christian of all the holidays. Now, we can put Christ in Christmas. That's okay. But Thanksgiving started by Christians who love the Lord and gave thanks. Would you come down here this morning and say, Lord, I thank you for my family. I haven't been everything I should have been to them. Shouldn't I have been the father I should have been? I failed you, but I need you. I need you more than anything today. And this coming Thursday, let it be a new day for me, a fresh start in my life to take my family and put it where it belongs. Put it first, right next to the Lord. Put him first and put your family right there with him. Always put God first and then that. Father, in Jesus' name, I delivered what you put on my soul. I hope I helped somebody. I sure didn't come in here to hurt anybody. I came in here to help them. And maybe somebody needs to come down and say, Lord, you, you're, you're talking to me. You're, you've spoken to me. And even what that preacher said was the truth. There may be somebody in this house today that if you are, if you are, if you're hooked on pornography, you can get out of it. You can get out of it. And you're probably sneaking around, too. You wouldn't want your wife to know it. You're probably sneaking around. Why don't you want to quit living like that? Why don't you just give it to God? Ask the Holy Ghost to cleanse your soul, your spirit, and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And give you victory over it. He can. Over everything. Including that. And you'll be amazed at how it strengthens your marriage. Makes it what it ought to be. Maybe you need to do that today. Maybe you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, that preacher preached the truth. He was talking to me. And let me tell you something in here in this house this morning. I do not have a name at all of anybody that I know is guilty of that. But I'm going to tell you right now, I believe with all of my soul, somebody is. Amen. Father, we thank you for those that have come down to the front. Lord, they come before you to pray. They come to seek your face. And Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, that we can come to the end of our way. We can come to the end of our road. We can exhaust our resources. We can say and do everything that we can possibly say and do and still be in the pit and not have any victory. And that, Lord, is what I want you to do this morning for these dear folk is to show them that when they've exhausted everything, that that's where you start. That once they've, that once they've reached the end of their road, that you'll make a new road for them. And once, they, once they've messed up their life, that you'll create a new life for them. And our Heavenly Father, that's why Christ came in this world. He came and he died on that cross to give us that hope and that joy and that peace that we need. Bless every one of them. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Cleanse them, my Heavenly Father. Give them their, give them their joy back, Lord. And Heavenly Father, let them, let them leave out of here. Lord, they came in here moaning, but let them leave out with a song in their heart. God bless them now. I pray this in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. 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 We'll stand up and we'll sing a verse or something. Whatever you got there, brother. 382 in the All-American Church Hymnal, Softly and Tenderly.